Hey, Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode of Random Musings from the Kalingo Trails Guru. This is going to be a really special uh, podcast. It's not often we get someone like our guest, Jasmine Adams, on. And I feel like, Jasmine, this is the first of many uh, collabs and features myself. I know we're going live soon on your channel i've been watching we got to get into like your 30 for 30 i thought that was like amazing but before we get started i just want to give viva a shout out for sponsoring the podcast thank you viva viva they've got they're bringing jasmine you've worked with viva as a CRA. oh yeah for sure so they're empowering sites i don't know if you know about this but they're giving out e-reg for free to sites I didn't know sites, that. Yeah, they're letting sites like get started. They don't ever want to charge sites. They they're getting plenty of money from sponsors. Over 450 sponsors are already Viva customers for decades. Viva oh. started in sales for a lot of these pharma companies. Then they realized there's a huge opportunity in R and D, and now they're realizing that the way to get everything on the cloud and digitized is the sites need to use it because the sites are super fragmented. Like there's a long tail of sites and basically sponsors want to do what sites want to do. So Viva understands like, Hey, if we empower sites, give them free tools, more sponsors are going to use our stuff. And that's what they're doing. They're starting with e-reg. There's rumors about other things. I mean, you guys can draw the lines, connect the dots, what they're going to do, but they're a huge company publicly traded. They're not going anywhere. They can afford to do this. So they have Site Vault. It's completely free for sites. They can passively share regulatory documents with the CRA. So the CRA can stop emailing about, hey, you forgot CV for this sub I and you forgot mm -hmm. this thing. It's all in there already. So as long as the site puts it in, sponsor has it in their TMF. It's already there. Site has to opt into it, allow to share to TMF with sponsor. Or you can just use it for yourself as a site. So that's what I did. Link underneath the video and in the show notes. Site Vault, completely free, no contract. I literally signed up my site, Yuma Clinical Trials, in about 10 minutes. Um, never signed anything. And I have a portal, and I already started putting my SOPs and stuff in there. So it's a good way to oh, get started wow. sites. Let's do I'll it. I'll definitely let everybody know about that. I didn't know that. But Viva you, is, is amazing. So, yeah, for sure. Especially the sites that are still using binders. And it's like the oncology ones, especially. And it's like 15 binders. <laughs> yes. And we're going to get into that because you're <laughs> an experienced CRA. But thank you. Viva's going to love you too now. There you go. Yes. <laughs> I, will, I wish they, I, I'm so glad you told me this. Like, I'm literally going to tell everybody. Because we desperately need that in the oncology space, like desperately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've been yes. saying we need to switch over to E-Reg for site. So this is amazing. Now they have an option and it's free. What, it's what free. do you have to say? You can't complain now. It's free. It's free. To add to that, all right, I was going to end it, but we'll add. Viva's going to not complain. There, Once you join, there's a list of sites that use Viva that Viva keeps internally. Mm -hmm. that sponsors get access to so oh wow that's one of the reasons i did it for you my clinical trials like i'm trying to put my new site on the map why not put my site out there like and let 450 plus sponsors know that we exist that you exist right especially for the new sites get and you know we talked about i have sites reaching out all the time yes asking for help so i'll definitely let them know this is this is amazing. Why, why haven't I heard about this? That's why I'm sponsored. They want more people to hear. About it. <laughs> so thank oh you. Oh my Viva. God, this is amazing. Yeah. Yes, I'll definitely spread the word. Okay. Yeah. And if you want me to connect you to some folks at Viva, I know some people that are like running this whole thing. So just let me know. Yeah, definitely. We can talk about that after. That'd be cool. For sure. There's a lot to discuss with Jasmine Adams. Jasmine, I don't even know where to start because, first of all, like, I'm glad I discovered you, I want to say, like, a year ago. I think the first time I saw you 
I saw somebody else doing YouTube and I was like, I'm always like paying attention when someone else starts doing YouTube. First of all, I love it. Like everyone assumes, oh, you know, you hate it when someone else does. No, I don't. Matter of fact, it motivates me to make more content (laughs) because it's competition in a healthy way. Uh, It's like, it's like capitalism, like free market dynamics. If no one else was doing YouTube videos and it has just been me, like since 2010, I would get bored. I would probably fall into bad habits. I would probably start just doing whatever I want. I still do whatever I want, but like in a sloppy way to where yeah. I'm not really considering the end user. And having more people like Brad, like you, like ECRG, who, by the way, everyone I just mentioned, I'm friends with except you so far, but this is my first time I know you. We'll be friends. We'll be friends. We already (laughs) talked for like an hour before the podcast, so it'll be natural. But like, these are not competitors. Like, and if they are, it's like in a healthy way. Like, hey, I'm just going to make another video. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to get up five in the morning, make a video. Why not? Why not? So this is great. Like, that's that's when I first saw you. And I was like, all right, this, this lady actually has like a bunch of experience she's not just like a talking head that speaks in platitudes like she's an operator and we actually need more of that we need more operators that are creating content and not just con not just people creating content for the sake of having a voice like i mean i'm sure there's an audience for that too but real recognize real all right and like you can't fake having decades of experience. So Jasmine, who's a senior CRA now um, in oncology, you heard her talk about oncology, senior oncology CRA. You can't get more (laughs) qualified than that in our space, first of all. Have you ever done anything besides oncology? I have. When I first started out, I did a little bit of cardio, neuro, and gastro. Ah, okay. Which one do you like the best? Even though they're rough, I still like oncology best. But that's what I've been, that's what I did in graduate school. So even before clinical research, I was on the bench research side, preclinical. And so I did oncology all throughout that time too. So wow. it's been, yeah, it's been my thing. Like I did the basic molecular biology oncology work. Um, all that stuff. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so bench research. So many people. Well, let's start from the beginning. Like, yeah. when did you first decide? Okay, I want to like have a healthcare career in my life. So that was like middle school, high school. I said I wanted to be a doctor. You know, everybody's like doctor, nurse, (laughs) lawyer, teacher. Those were the things we knew. But I didn't even know the clinical research world existed then. So I went to undergrad. I was a pre-med biochemistry major. um, And that was the path I was going. But um, as I- Where'd you go? Where'd you go to undergrad? Xavier in New Orleans. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah. So, you know, they're all like, they focus on like pre-dental, pre-pharmacy stuff too, but pre-med is like their thing. So I did um, some internships with doctors and stuff like that. And then once I saw the the lifestyle, I was like, I don't think this is for me long-term. Um, just the amount of school. And then, you know, you got your residency. And then if you really wanted to make the, and not that it's all about money, but like, if you wanted to get past just the low six figures, you had to go into surgery. And then those residencies were forever. It was just a lot. And then being on call. So I was like, there has to be other options out there besides just pharmacy or dental or medicine. And then um, somebody I went to school with, she was going to graduate school. So I found out about that bench science world. And I was like, well, maybe this is it. And then I was thinking I could get a PhD and then go work for pharma and do it that way. Um, so that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to get a PhD in pharmacology. I knew about regulatory affairs. Like I had spoke to some, several of the regulatory affairs people, but that was kind of like boring to me because it was so far removed from the science and the medicine and the patients. 
So I thought about that for a while, but then I knew that wasn't going to work long term. So pursued the PhD in pharmacology. And then once I, and I was in a like translational research lab. So we worked with like, we had some compounds for Merck and Pfizer and stuff where we were testing them on our animal models and cell lines to see, you know, if wow. they had any if they had any benefit for pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, stuff like that. Um, and that's when I slowly got introduced into the clinical research world. And then I saw this whole other side and I was like, oh my God, this is it. Cause it's like being in the lab that can be boring because it's mundane. You know, we talked about that, doing the experiments over and over. Um and working with the animal models, the cell lines, things like that. But then clinical research was science, medicine, and research. It was like everything combined. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I have to get in that industry. And then, you know, the CRA job is like the one that screams the most. Every time you Google, it's like CRA comes up, at least at that time. Um, and so, and I also saw the MSL role that you mostly you can get in without a doctorate level degree, but you know, mostly in the U S they want you to have that doctorate level degree. Yeah. So I was like, well, let me pursue the, you know, leave my PhD program early. My, I met with my committee, my PI, they said I could leave early with the masters. I had to do a public defense and thesis and stuff. Um, but I so was you after left, you left academia with a master's degree. Yes. And, and that was after doing been, three years. You, after doing three years of PhD. Mm -hmm. So you had one more year left and you were like, nah, it's still not worth it. Yeah, potentially. I, I guess, yeah, I could have had one more year left. Um, and it just That says a lot. It wasn't worth it to me. I mm -mm. just did, read an article yesterday, Stat News. It said the great exodus from academia. <laughs> and it wasn't I mean, worth it. It's it was the article said it's decades in the making, like it's kind of the climax of it now in 2022, but it's decades in the making. So this, you're talking like what, like around what year was this? This was 2012. Wow. I remember 2012 was like one of the worst years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. OK, so there you go. Like Jasmine, at, here's somebody who would have one year from just academia like having a phd being a doctor right and she said no it's not worth it but this private industry clinical research kind of where it's at and that's from an employee perspective this was not jasmine adams the career coach yet <laughs> like because we haven't even talked about the capitalism <laughs> in private industry like we talked about we're going to talk about careers and working there. That's what you do with your coaching. That's what we do with all our academies. But that's still the tip of the iceberg. Once you get into business opportunity and creating true equity, everyone likes to bring up DE&I. True equity is ownership of something. Absolutely. It could be ownership of an idea, yeah. But we live in the United States which is the most capitalistic country ever in the history of civilization. <laughs> so what does equity mean in a capitalistic society? It means ownership in a business. Yep. I'll yep. just stop there because we got to get into your career. <laughs> we got to get into your career. <laughs> but no, you make a great point. And before we move, just to yeah. point out that all of my friends, colleagues that were that did end up finishing. Now they're reaching out to me, begging me to help them get in the industry. And they have a PhD now. They went the the full way. Me and you got to do, after your life, we got to do a series of podcasts. And we can switch on each other's shows of why it pays to be in private industry versus academia. Because oh, yeah, I get too much absolutely. hate for that. And I'd re I'd like to to share some of that hate, Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to share some of that hate. <laughs> but no, I'd love to, and it's and it's from personal experience. It's like I'm not just speaking hypothetical, so I'm on board with you. I agree. Let's do it. But let's get this one's going to motivate people because this is what we want to do. We want to motivate people who are thinking about getting in or even already in. 
because from a research assistant, so you were at UNC, that's where my sister-in-law went, actually, mm -hmm. um, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, you say, you know what, I was PhD, I'm almost done, but I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Do you, like, you were only a year away, like, honest question, do you still, do you regret it at all, not oh, finishing no, it? Oh, no, absolutely not. And technically, if I wanted to, I could still go back and do whatever I needed to do to technically graduate. It's just not worth it. It's not. That's so that says so much about the state of affairs. Okay, so after research assistant at UNC Char UNC Chapel Hill, where you were doing lab research, um, you became a coordinator for a private site. It looks like in Very Savannah, mm -hmm. and only two months. So what happened here? I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. <laughs> we can. <laughs> it's a long time ago. But um, let's just say they were doing some questionable things. And, you know, this is the beginning of my career. So I didn't want to get off to a bad start and get in with a site that gets audited. And then they're beyond like 483. They're like shut down on the news. But what questionable, so, what kind of studies were they doing? Um, all types of internal medicine studies. So they were doing some vaccines, some weight loss, like diabetes, some infectious disease, like, you know, herpes, things like that. Um, they had a couple of gastro studies. Um, so they were big, relatively big. And they, yeah, they were operating as a, um, an SMO too. So they had ah. some, that's the thing. They had some like, kind of spread out all around Georgia, basically. So you don't even need to get into what questionable things there were because SMOs were known for putting quality at the backseat to growth, enrollment and growth. That sums it up good. That's, that's <laughs> what, no, that summed it up. That's essentially what they were doing to the point where, I mean, it was just flat out. It sometimes it was just fraud, fraudulent data to you know, what was the worst thing you saw without we're not mentioning who they are, but what was one of the worst things you saw? Mm, one of the worst things I would say is just flat out making up data just to say that they had a new patient enrolled. So, you know, they could get that screened patient money in the budget. So patient um, didn't exist or patient, patient exists, but patient didn't exist. And then Wow, that's egregious. Had, they had patients that they did exist, but they didn't qualify. They, you know, were excluded in some way. So they would tweak it just a little bit. Yeah. You know, if it was a lab value or if it was, you know, a blood pressure or, you know, some type of vital sign, what have you, they would find a way to tweak it just a bit. So they would then meet criteria and qualify. Yeah. Well, that sums up SMOs nicely. This is why you don't hear about SMOs anymore, by the way. Um, and I'm pretty new... sure they've they've shut. The last time I checked, I think they're shut down now. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I would hope so. I mean, who knows? Those people are still probably operating. Somewhere. Yeah, they probably maybe started a new name, but at least that name, I don't think they, they exist anymore, at least not under that name. They're probably ACRP certified in everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. So then you went, so you were like, I'm out of here. Or like, what did you do? Were you let go? Or like, what did you just want to leave? No, I resigned. I did try to, I gave them the two week notice, Um, you know, the standard two week notice. And I resigned. I just, and I, and I always tell people this because people feel sometimes like trapped, like, oh, I can't leave a job if I just started. Right. Mm -hmm. But if it goes against your values, your philosophies, your goals, it doesn't matter how long you've been there. Um, sometimes we do the best we can when we choose companies, but you just don't know until you know. Right. So if it's, yeah. if you feel like your career is in danger, um, and in our industry, people forget, like people have gone to jail over this type of stuff. So even your own personal livelihood could be in danger by you signing off on something or being a part of something that's mm -hmm. literally illegal, a federal crime, like you got to go. Yeah. So that must be, so after that, I want to get into this a little bit. So you got, you left and you went into a legal 
field, like not even research. Well, a little bit, medical device, but it was really like you were a legal field assurance specialist. So the name is kind of sticky. Don't ask me why they named it that, but BARD is a med device company. So essentially oh. it's like with devices instead of like, you know how it's, um, and then they were post-marketing, like already approved devices. So instead of like AEs, I was processing complaints. Hmm. So it's essentially okay. like the long-term follow-up of the the products that were already on the market and seeing like what might be causing some type of, you know, events okay. essentially. The name is confusing, but that's that's ultimately what I was doing, specifically on um women's health products. Gotcha. I know exactly what kind of role that is. That makes sense. I had I had a friend, actually my brother's friend was doing that for a heart monitoring company. Um yeah. but okay, so you were at you left UNC Chapel Hill, like literally the peak of like <laughs> um prestige, right? And you go to this SMO that's basically making up data. Do you ever question yourself like, damn? You know, I think I made the wrong decision. Like, I should have just stayed PhD. No, never. <laughs> Still never. Hmm. Never. So you knew not all research was like this private. You just had a feeling like there's no way this whole industry could be thriving if everyone operates like these guys. Right. And you know, there's always going to be some bad apples in every industry, right? So I just Yeah, but for your first that. job right after you quit to have the bad apple, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty hardcore. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. But I never really thought about it like that. I was just, I've always been the person that's like, you know, there's always opportunities for everyone. You just got to be open to finding them. So I was like, well, oh, looks like this is it for me. On to the next one, right? Man, I would have been questioning myself so much. And I know my family would have been like, told you, should have stayed. <laughs> you know, because they're conservative, old school. Like my my dad was, was a PI. That's how I actually got started. I was pre-med and I thought it would look good to like intern at his site and the management there was terrible. They all left, they took money. And he, he was like, I told you like this private research site, it's not, it's not good. It, like use it to get to med school and that's it. He's like old school immigrant mentality. Like, Hey, just do this for a little bit. Little did he know two decades later, still here. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but I know I would have questioned myself if I were in your situation. That's pretty, that says a lot about you, Jasmine. Cool. Um, and one thing, I guess also my parents, they did have their opinions, but, um, <laughs> I'm the first, like not, neither one of my parents, um, went to college. So it's not like, you know, I didn't really want to listen to them because, mm -hmm. They don't really know. Like, they hadn't been in college. They hadn't been in graduate school. They don't understand the big picture. Yeah. So I understood where they were coming from, but I just knew there had to be bigger and better. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was bigger and better. So you went to a big CRO um, after five months at the medical device company. Uh, and then you, since then, you basically worked for all the CROs. Uh, I'm looking now. So you were a CTA. Then a clinical monitoring associate, which I'm guessing is the same thing. All these titles. What is with all these different titles? I tell people all the time. They, and they're getting more and more creative these days. Have you seen the clinical research ambassador? No, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's another term they're using now for CRAs. For and CRA? CRAs. And then they say it's bigger than a CRA because you're... <laughs> Because you're like taking wow. ownership of the site as if you don't as a CRA already. But wait, ownership. Yeah. We like, need to splice out that one minute <laughs> clip of me talking about what ownership actually is. Yeah, that's the thing now. Like, because they're saying like they want to get back to, I guess, before my time where the CRAs did everything for the site. Because, you know, now we have the in house support. Yes. So that's what they mean when they say ownership, like they literally go to you for everything, which would be great if they didn't uh, have you on seven protocols and 50 sites. <laughs> yeah. So they're trying to get rid. This is a nice way to try to get rid of like the remote site monitors and the in-house And the series. CTAs and yeah. Let's All just call it, let's try to eliminate this position because <laughs> it's hard 
to get so many, and there's a lot of turnover. So let's just give CRA a new title where they think it's something else, but it's actually more work. It's just yeah. a nice way to say more work um, so that we can make more money. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Okay, so then safety specialists, I mean, literally worked for like all the big CROs. If you name a random CRO that's big, Jasmine worked for them. <laughs> They're here, all of them. Well, I, I think, think one's I missing. I missed a couple of them. Yeah, one's missing that I see. Yeah. Okay. And then senior CRA. So you went from safety specialist to, is that, so you jump ship a lot. Is that like something, because you're not alone. Like, is that unfortunately one of the only ways to get like promotions and stuff? Every once in a while, I'll run into somebody who worked for some a company that they were able to get it promoted internally within a reasonable amount of time. But unfortunately, nowadays, it really is the only way to really advance your career in the way that you want, I'll, I'll add. Um, and I always tell people that I don't believe in job hopping. I feel like for people that even want to bring up the word job hopping, I feel like it can be used as a career growth tool, a career growth, a career development tool. A lot of people will hear this in there and be like, she's crazy. But seriously, you can't, your, your manager, your company, like, you're they don't they're not responsible for your career they're not responsible for your your growth your development it's all on you mm -hmm. and sometimes company you know they cultivate that internally unfortunately during that time anyways i feel like companies now are getting the hint and they're starting to really put more effort into that but back then that that wasn't a thing so you know it was literally a strategy to get to where I wanted to go, which was the CRA role. Okay. And now, so now you, and now you're still doing CRA. So it looks like your first CRA role was 2015. 2015. Yep. So um, a few well, years now, after now you... I'm um, CTM actually. Oh, okay. Now you're CT. Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, Tiffany, right? Ashton. She's been on the show a few times. Um, She's CTM. She has the CTM Academy. Oh, yeah. You guys went live together, right? Or yeah, recently? we did. Okay. Yes. I didn't watch that one, but um, I saw it. I saw it. So, okay. So now you're CTM. CTM, yes. I switched over. Which Still one do you like better, CRA or CTM? If you could only um, pick one the rest of your life. I think I'm. I think I'm still going with CRA. <laughs> okay <laughs> so is that considered like instead of a promotion is that like a downgrade of job or like from ctm to cra or like and then why do you pick that for the rest of your life if you could only pick one so i know a lot of ctms that have decided to go back to cra so I wouldn't say it's a downgrade, especially depending on the company. Like you might actually even make more money as the CRA, typically, mm -hmm. unless you've been like, you know, you're a senior CTM and you've been a CTM for like years. But at that like entry level CTM, um, that entry level CTM space, it's most of the times you can make more money as a senior CRA. Um, Why? Because you work more or travel more? Well, they use travel as one of the excuses, but in terms of a CRO standpoint, the CRAs are the ones that's bringing in the money. They're like the the franchise players on the basketball team. Mm. So they're going to get more money, right? Because they're the ones that's making the sales. <laughs> they're the diva wide receiver and CTM's like the offensive coordinator or something. Basically. So they're the ones raking in the money. So they want to make the CRAs more happy because... Everything, which is why they're always pushing the report metrics, the visit metrics, because that's their bread and butter. That's what's that's paying everybody's bills. So mm. that's why. What's the main report metrics for CRAs that they measure you on? Like, because you've been a CRA for such a long time, so you've probably had, I don't know what they call it, progress report or tell you how you're doing. 
what, yeah. what's like the main metrics they look for? So at the larger CROs, it varies. Like some of the smaller CROs and then on the sponsor side, they're a little bit more flexible. But typically speaking, um, everybody's going to care about um, your report. So we have a first draft metrics, which is typically five business days um, from the day, the last day of the visit. And then the final draft is due typically 10 business days. I've been places where or works for um, CROs that had me aligned with sponsors where theirs was a little bit longer, 15 business days. So three weeks. Um, but that's one of them. So the turnaround time for having the report done, um, the confirmation and follow-up letters, confirmation letter, that's all over the place now. Um, Cause before people were saying like a week before the visit or two weeks, now they're just saying, just get it sent <laughs> before the visit, even if it's the day before. Um, but some sites- I get like, them sent after. <laughs> as a site. I was about to say that. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you forget, and I've I've been that person a time or two. Um, but the follow up letter is the main thing, so they always like to have that within. Uh, most times, it's within ten days, so the um the same deadline as the report. They kind of usually match those. Um, the, you want to have that over to the site, and then also um, another thing internally is we have a lot of training that we have to do. So we have deadlines on those. So if you miss the, even the corporate training that has nothing to do with your study specific training, if you miss those, they make that a big deal. So what are some on- examples of like, are the trainings good? Number one, not this is not a reflection of who you currently work for. Just in general, are the trainings some of, good? Some of them are, but some of them is like um, this harassment. Um, you know, company harassment or um, Mm. like IT safety, computer safety type of stuff. Cause you have like all the people that are fishing now and trying to get your, you know, hack into your computer and stuff. So we have like basic stuff like that. That's just like, it's old at this point. Like we get it. We don't, don't harass people at work. Don't leave your computer (laughs) computer open and unattended. So I guess the theme is, it's training that's good for the company, not good for you. It's Absolutely. like CYA for them. Hey, if Jasmine leaves her computer on and sponsor your data gets stolen, we had her trained. So, you know, it's not on us. That's basically what the kind of training you're talking about. Basically. It's and not then- like, hey, you're going to do a new diabetes study. So here's like a training on diabetes. Listen, I'm actually reading this guy's diabetes for dummies, but uh, it's not like that where you're learning about a new therapeutic condition or is it ever like that? So they do have, and this, we're talking about the larger CROs. We always have like a learning management system where it's a bunch of different training videos and then they throw all the SOPs in there, work instructions, all that stuff. Um, and it might be in there. But you have to go on your own and find it and do that extra work yourself. It's not going to be one of the required trainings as a part of your metrics. I see. Okay. Okay. I was always curious because I've never worked for any big company, actually. Um, So I'm curious. And as a site owner, I look to provide my employees with training. And the sponsors give us plenty that they have to do anyways. But I'm always looking for things that are good for them and good for me yeah. as the company but not only good for me like we don't have almost any cya training just hey here's the sop sign that you understand it here's the protocol training log sign that you know the protocol but like what like we'll do like phlebotomy courses or we'll do like courses on therapeutic conditions that kind of benefit both because if my employees are smarter like if we're doing a diabetes study and my employees know how to talk about diabetes to diabetic patients That benefits not only them for their future, but me as well as the side owner. So I like those kind of trainings. Yeah, yeah. Which is why it goes back to, I always say, it's on us to take control of our careers. Nobody else. Yeah. Why do so many people expect the companies to take care of them? I don't know. I I think it it goes back to, um, I want to just say entitlement. But I know it's bigger than that. Um, I also feel like it's just um, 
the lack of information, because we've all been brainwashed that you go to school, you get a degree and then you get a job and they think it's in that order. And they don't realize that, no, there's some stuff, stuff in between the lines, like that you have to still like brand market and sell yourself, which they don't cover in school at all. Right. So no. they just think, I have this piece of paper now, so I'm qualified. So where is the job? Well, they don't want you good. If you think about it, they don't want you by they, meaning big corporations, small ones too, I guess. They don't want you to be good at branding yourself. Oh, no, definitely. Matter of fact, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but you ran into some issues because you're branding and. Yeah, I don't mind talking about it. I think it's, which is why they they just proved to me how much more important than I even realized (laughs) branding, marketing, and selling yourself is. Because it wasn't like I was, and for those people who don't know who what I'm talking about, but one of my employers told me that essentially I had to shut down my coaching, which we haven't gotten to, but shut down um, CRA coaching, my coaching business, and my podcast. Or resign from the company. Um, And I immediately, it was a no-brainer. I was like, okay, well, I'm resigning. Just because I have worked on branding, marketing, and selling myself, I knew it wasn't going to be an issue to go work for another company. So it just proves even more so that you have to have your own thing because you don't want to ever be dependent on any company, any person for a job. Right. I think that's the key word is depending. I think the reason why they... By they meaning big corporations, and they also meaning academia who funnels out workers, right? Um, there's this book written in the 30s, I think, called The Grunch of Giants. And it talks about how the educational system, so starting from elementary, and we're still in the same system, by the way, even though academia is imploding right before our eyes. Here we have someone who was a year away from PhD and said, nah, I'm over it. But basically, from elementary school, they train you to be workers. Like the and you know who funded all this was the Rockefellers. So they got in with, with the educational systems and they said, Hey, we need this was the Industrial Revolution. We need more workers. Like, but we need them to do exactly like how we've built our systems. So we need to teach them young. Like this is why they don't teach financial independence in school to this day. I don't know. Some schools do now, like private maybe, but public, they don't. I I was in public school. I never learned anything about business or how to run your own brand yeah. branding. Forget yeah. about branding. What was that? They don't, because it doesn't benefit big corporation. It It benefits big corporation for you, Jasmine, to be unknown. And a commodity so that you don't get opportunities sent your way so that you stay longer with them and they have the leverage to tell you, no, you're not getting paid more or you're not getting a promotion. Yeah. That's what it's for. Yeah. And it's I decades agree. old, century old. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why most companies don't have, they have some career development on surface level that they say um internally they but have to now yeah i was about to say now back then they nobody really had anything but now they'll have like those trainings that's available that they don't tell you about but <laughs> so they do it <laughs> <laughs> but they do it so they can look good though <laughs> like that's, that's why it. they do it so they can say they have it but it's not really a thing unless you have good line managers or good mentors throughout the way because I've had some really good line managers and every single time we met we had the conversation of okay what's your next career goal and things that we could do to stay on track and help me reach those goals but then you have those managers that are just I don't know what's going on with them and they're like the total other end of the spectrum so that makes a big difference too Yes, you could bring up a good point, not to be like super negative, but I'm trying to, and you also trying to show people what the system is designed for. And it's always about incentives. Like, look at whatever this company says. Okay, that's fine. 
But what's their actual incentive? If you look, exactly. they're a publicly traded company. They're trying yeah. to return their primary duties, return profits for their shareholders. Uh, branding for their employees is, okay, we have to say we do it now. So we're going to do it and bury it here. And 90% of people will never see it or hear about it. Yeah. But if someone asks, we say, yeah, we empower our staff to take equity in their yeah. lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nonsense. Jasmine, this is nonsense. I agree. I agree. Stuff like that actually makes me mad. Okay, so back to um, CTM. And this is why, I like, you kind of now you work for a mid sized company. I always say small is the new big. Like, I think the smaller, the better. Yes, it's more risky, they, they're less stable. But once you're in the industry, you just prove, like, hey, you can hop around. So, yeah. how do you compare? working for a smaller CRO as opposed to like most of your career, it's been big CRO. Um, so I would say, first of all, um, the culture is completely different. Um, I definitely don't feel like just a number or just, you know, and not to say that, and I'm not saying like all the things that you just said, they still apply, right? They still have, <laughs> to make their um investors happy, the board members happy. They still have those things. So don't get don't get it twisted. Like they still have their own agenda. So you I still promote like you still have to take control of your career. But just in terms of the environment, um it's completely different. So you don't just feel like a number. You can get more of that. Even the onboarding process is different. So when I, for example, when I had my first um, my first CRA role, like they send you the computer like the week before. They send you your equipment the week before. In the box, they have the instructions on how to log in. Like they have like maybe your first week agenda of things to do. And you're just on your own trying to wing it and figure it out. That And this is me as a brand new CRA, right? Um, and then you may have already been assigned a manager. You may not. So you literally don't know who to talk to, where to go, nothing. And you just hope to get that email saying, Hey, I'm your manager. Or you got to go back to the recruiter and say, I haven't heard from anybody. Like, am I really employed? Like what, <laughs> I see what is going on? I know I got the equipment, um, as opposed to on the mid size side, People are checking in saying, hey, do you have what you need? Following up with you, making sure just just even to say, hey, I know this is your first day. Um, everything is outlined like this is what you need to focus on for day one. Day two, my manager and my manager was new and he still followed up with me every single day just to check in and say, hey, I want to make sure nothing came up. Everything was fine for the day type of thing. Um and then the training, I feel like, is more, we still have those sexual harassment, IT, technology trainings. Like you said, you have to check, they they have check to. those yeah. boxes yeah. off. Um, but I feel like they also incorporated, they made sure that you knew where, um, like they have this whole portal for therapeutic training specifically for you to advance your therapeutic area skills if you want to. They have this whole other system for soft skill development. They have another system for technology development. So if you want to get really good at Excel, if you want to start using OneNote, whatever the case is, they have like all these other things, not just even clinical research specific where they can, they support that development. Um, and I have a really great line manager. So day one, he's like, we need to, what, what's your goals? And then he's like, okay, well, we're going to focus on this, this, and this to hit those goals. So it just seems like it's more of like a, a closer knit environment where they're more supportive and giving you the tools that you need to not only succeed at whatever role you're at, um, but also try to at least add on some additional development skills. Okay. I like how you broke that down because it's not like, and by the way, like when you brought up incentives, like, okay, you got big, small, medium, small companies, like the incentives are still, I'm not immune. I'm a site owner. I'm a business owner. Like my company, Yuma Clinical Trials, we have incentives too, right? But my theory is the closer you are to the decision maker or the the founder, if you can, but the a decision maker the better off you will be 
personally for yourself as a worker. Yeah. So like, but my company too, like we're not immune. My company has objectives as well. We have goals, we have coordinators. And, and sometimes my incentive is to make sure that the coordinators stay as long as they can, because that's my goal as a business owner, like cost me more to find somebody new, but there's limits to what I can do. And, and anytime a coordinator wants to talk to me, it's me. It's not like a manager I hired yeah. that says, Hey, represent me. Because a lot of dynamics change when you go from like founder or like leadership to manager yeah. to employees. Because now the manager, it's a derivative of above and they have their own like internal yeah. objectives. So that that's why small is, is better in my opinion, but it's not like it's heaven, you know, for employees either. But it, it I think it's still better than the big yeah. one. So I, I like how you brought that up. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so now you have a podcast and you have uh you're a career coach for CRAs. Um so let's talk about why you created the podcast. Because that's how I first saw you. I now I remember it was like watching a video on YouTube. I'm like, oh, this new person. I'll subscribe. And I think we started messaging like slowly back and forth, but mm -hmm. we never actually did any collabs. <laughs> but now we'll do a bunch. So why'd so, you start it? So I actually started the coaching before the podcast. Uh, um, okay. And time and time again, everybody kept, even my clients and then people that weren't clients that just needed help. Um, they found it very odd or strange that there was not like this specific clear cut path to being a CRA, like it is with a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. Like, you know, you go to this school, that school, you do this, take this test, this residency, whatever, get your license. Right. Um, so it was very confusing to them. And so I was like, well, what if I had a platform where I could just bring people in to share their stories and then they could, real life examples of what people did so yeah they might you know still be a little bit confused but at least they get the fact that what I'm trying to explain to them that there is no set path it, it literally is not there's no CRA school like medical school or law school mm -hmm. so that's what gave me the idea um and it actually started out as like I didn't plan on it being a podcast before I just planned on it being like just the thing that I posted on YouTube here and there, um, or maybe for my clients or something like that. But then as I started um, reaching out to people and seeing who would be interested and started talking about it more, then people were like, well, you should just turn this into a podcast. So I was like, okay, I'd never, I didn't even really I had like, I I had listened to a couple podcasts, but I wasn't even really a big podcast person before then. So I didn't even know where to start. Um, but lo and behold, here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing really good too. So the podcast is called Confessions of a CRA. Um, and you did a thing recently. Well, recently now, hello, watching people watching in the future, where you went live. This was insane. You went live every day right for 30 days in a row i did i did so i have including thanksgiving i saw that one actually <laughs> i was like this lady's crazy i did so i have a i have a business coach and she gave me a challenge of like going doing something she didn't say how to be live but like just being visible every day <laughs> for the month of november and I was like, well, the easiest thing was to just go live because, you know, you just talk. You don't have to like, I don't know, do any like for me, create and post are like, it's a lot. It's rough or like pre-recorded videos and stuff. It takes a lot. But, it, you know, if you go live, you just turn on your camera, you start talking. So that's what prompted that. And I wanted to cover some of the most common problems that people came to me with their CRA job search. So that's what prompted that. Some of the, okay, and what are some of those? Like, what are the main? Because I get FAQs all the time, like over the years. So I kind of have like, 
I already know like these are the topics, but what are yours? I want to see if they're different than like what I'm getting. So, well, the main problem is that people think that you need some type of um, certification. You know, everybody's big on, we talked about this before, education. So they think you need a specific special degree or a specific type of certification or whatever. They've been indoctrinated. Um, they have and they can't it's it's amazing because even after having a conversation with them and going through all the things at the end of it they're like well i'll follow back up with you once i finish my um my yeah. phd <laughs> i get that my too. second master's or whatever it's like okay whatever yeah <laughs> um <laughs> my second master's is insane they say yeah i get that too do you think i, I here hey dan i'm an international medical graduate so they're a doctor in another country I have a master's degree in health, something health related that I just got here. Do you think I want to be a CRA? Do you think I should get a master's in clinical research? That's like a typical quite I say, no, you don't. You can already be just do in-house CRA or do remote site monitor, be a coordinator. And in a year or two, you'll be a CRA. They say, thank you. I think I'm going to do the master's in clinical research. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally Isn't that every crazy. Yeah, it's, it's like crazy. why do they even ask us if they're just gonna do? So are they I... that plugged into the matrix where they're they've been indoctrinated and they believe like, or they might see you on YouTube, me on YouTube, and be like, okay, that works for him, but it won't work for me. I think so, and he, I even did a podcast episode where I I made up this. It's a made up term, but I call it institutionalized education shock. Because they're like just so plugged into the matrix that it's no like no matter what you or me say, even though we've been there, done that, it's still like it goes in in one ear out the other. Because I would have given that literally that same advice. I tell people that all the time, and they do the same thing. It's like okay, well, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna get the masters. It's just so because they're beating it into your our brains from birth, essentially. Yeah, and then who's getting rich off of that? I mean, we didn't even get into that. When student loans are subsidized by government, so basically um, the banks are getting guaranteed money. Because even when you go bankrupt, your student loans don't, don't go anywhere. <laughs> it's so, like the one thing that you can't do anything with, right? Yeah, so the Rockefellers had this brilliant idea. It just created like so much corruption. Because they had this idea to crank out workers, but then in the 60s or 70s, I don't know when it was, the 70s or 80s, I think student loans with with the financial aid and then the banking system and federal law rewriting bankruptcy laws, universities were like, awesome. Now we can create more degrees. There's a lot of useless degrees too. A lot of them. A lot. And we're going to jack up the prices because we're prestigious. And it's even better because not only we get paid more as banks and it's guaranteed money, but these people, they're going to be in so much debt when they graduate that they're going to have to work for one of our colleagues running corporation XYZ yeah. for life. For life. Yeah. This and these people want more money. degrees. More degrees. I have... <laughs> um, one client now, God bless her soul. Um, she has a bachelor's. She has two masters. She's working on a PhD. She's doing the PMP certification. And I keep trying to tell her, like, <laughs> you don't need, you don't need all, like, what you're literally killing to the point where she was, she's like killing herself. So, Jasmine, okay. At some point, we have to blame the individual, too, because, yes, it's like the system's created literally to work against you. But this person's doing it to herself. Like, do you think there is a group of people? I know my answer. I want yours. That think, OK, they're afraid to step out of their comfort zone and they've got comfortable being students. Oh, so absolutely. They think hey, at least I'm doing something and it's something yeah. honorable. Absolutely, which I I talked about it all in that institution, Institutionalized Education Shock podcast where that's literally a part of the problem is that there's they think that they're, they think that's doing something, like just 
staying busy or getting collecting. I call it collecting pieces of paper because that's what it is, right? You're just collecting paper. Collecting debt. <laughs> collecting paper and debt. Um, because you're not going towards your goal ultimately because you're not getting the experience that you need. Um, mm. And even now I'll tell people, if you're like starting from high school, go find a site that you can start. Even if you have to volunteer starting out as an intern, you're better off doing that and then doubling back to get a basic bachelor's degree. And you don't need to feel like you need to go to the most expensive school either. A degree is a degree, right? Especially at this point. Um, but start getting that experience first. Go work for a site. Be a study coordinator. It's the best place to start. And then do some part-time school or whatever. Um, and you'll get your career will shoot a lot quicker than the person that has the PhD and they've been in school the past 12 I know. years. I know. I tell them the same, but you know what? I think I figured out, at least for many, why they still go back to school. Because they get used to being students, so they're like, oh, I know how to do this, and it's into my comfort zone. And what you just said, okay, go to sites and try to intern. That requires them to go out there and like meet people and talk to them and get rejected. So they rather not do that. I guess, but I don't know any site, especially if you say you're willing to volunteer, that people need help. Yeah, they need help. <laughs> so but no, rejection is a real imagine- thing. Rejection is a real thing, especially like you said, when they don't learn soft skills in school. Well, that's so, true. Because that's if true. I've had people come to my site and say, hey, um, I want to be a CRA. I want to um, I want to volunteer here. But there's something about them that I know wouldn't work well in my site. Like I could just feel it. And they don't come with like value. Like they don't come with, hey, I watch this guy on YouTube and I can get studies for you. And I'll do it for free all I want in exchange. Or I can help you pass out flyers in the community to get patients. That's like the attitude I want. But you get like yeah. these smart people with degrees coming in and they're like, well, I have my uh, molecular biology uh, master's and, you know, I want to become a CRA. So I, I just want to shadow somewhere. Like to me as a oh, site no, owner, that sounds a, like, you know, that's a babysitting. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the complete total wrong approach. You have to bring value in wherever you know, you're trying to get in at. So even if you're volunteering, nobody wants, like you said, to babysit. You don't want to be a liability. (laughs) Plus to like scare my other employees. Like, why is this person coming here and like, you know, being a tyrant? (laughs) He's like an intern. So there's a little bit of like being afraid of rejection. And there's a little bit of humility because if you get all these degrees, you feel a little bit entitled, you know, like, hey, I got, I'm in six figures in debt. Why am I going to go door knock at a site where I could be a high school dropout doing that? It's funny you mentioned that because what you don't see on my resume, on my LinkedIn profile is I actually started volunteering at a site. And that's when I got like my very, very first clinical research experience. And that was after I had been to graduate school. That was after I had my master's. That was after I was in a PhD program. So, and I did not approach it in the way that you said it, that that one example, I wanted to bring value to the site. So I did, even before I, I went and started asking, I did my homework. I did everything that I could to find every book that I could. So I would at least know the basics of clinical research and not just go in there completely green and actually contribute and not just be hanging around, like seeing what I could soak in, but actually like contribute to the day-to-day operations. So for the people that are like, oh, I'm above that, like I've already gotten, you know, this degree or that degree, that is the complete total opposite attitude of, of having any type of success because I literally worked for free so that I could gain that initial basic clinical research experience at a site. But at the same time, not just hanging around being a leech, I contributed and I helped helped out when I needed to. I was making sure the reg bonders had everything that they needed to be in there, checking, finding patients calling patients, following up on patient visits, whatever needed to be done, I did it. So 
you cannot have that attitude if you truly want success. You can't. And I'm assuming this is one of the things you coach on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's like people can go into your academy. They can get the degrees. They can even come work with me. But if you don't shift that mindset and that thinking of just take, 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 there's nothing anybody could do to help you. Yeah, that is something that will require hours of podcast <laughs> to unpack. And actually, a course like yours, you know, how to, how to unpack. So what do you teach in your course for CRA coaching? Like, what do you, what do you, um, so I you strictly, don't break it down? I strictly focus on career development. So I don't get into the, the, the weeds <laughs> like you do with teaching them how to oh, be a marketer. Okay. Cause that is like, I feel like kudos to you because that's on another level of I still well if you're down we can do well we'll talk after but uh, like affiliate link for our students because we have that we have Ashley Margo in the internship she does like resume development and all that but it's not like full-on coaching like you have you know we do their resumes we do LinkedIn audit and then we have them do like the internship uh, they're writing monitoring reports for a breast cancer study our interns and it's put on their resume I'm a intern. Um, we call them quality assurance specialists cool. remote, or remote site monitor. We we interchange those two things. But there's no real career development. Theoretically, they get it for me for free, but like it's not like a organized thing like you have. Like, oh, okay. Well, but yeah, I'll, like, I stay away from that. all that. Yeah, we can talk about that after. So I don't like. I might if if they if it's somebody that comes to me that really has like a experience gap like because there's people that they've been a study coordinator CTA all the things but somewhere there was a disconnect on big picture Mm -hmm. and how it makes sense so then that's when I send them to your book or send them to your course or say you need some extra like CRA academy training or something like that because I I stick to career development so I you're like Tony Robbins for CRAs. Yes. And a lot of people, they confidence is an issue. Mindset is an issue. Um, limiting beliefs is an issue. So we work on all that stuff. And then it's it's essentially like not just helping them get the job, but having that complete transformation of going from like the job mindset to career mindset. So you don't have to depend on anybody ever again. So I'm really big on stop job searching and create a job attraction system. And that's what you do when you shift from the job mindset to the career mindset. So I walk them like immediately onboarding. We go through their resume. I always like to do a cover letter too, because some companies may or may not ask for it. And then their LinkedIn. Mm. What are your thoughts about that cover letter? I think they're useless, but <laughs> you know, some companies, they're old school. They don't want to get rid of it. So I you just like to- I do too. I thought they were useless until I needed to hire coordinators. So here's where I like, yeah, I didn't think I would because I made videos like I think they're dumb, but if you're going to have one, have one anyways. But when I post the ad for a coordinator for my site, I notice I'm getting all these resumes, but then the ones that stand out to me are the cover letters. Oh, like it. I read them. I actually read them because I could feel like I could understand what this person wants. Like as a small business owner, I'm looking for, okay, what is this person's long-term goal? Because it's going to take me at least a year to train them. I don't want to just train them for someone else. So what is their long-term? And like, do I think it's congruent with what I need and can I actually help them stick? Because that's my retention strategy is you be honest with me about your goals and I will try to keep you here as long as I can where it makes sense for you and me. And I'll help you do it. I had a review with a coordinator yesterday. I told her, if you want to start a site, you let me know. I'll help you. You don't want to do it here in Yuma. You're going to get killed. But <laughs> I'll help you when you go back to your hometown. So like the, it's really like the cover letter to me is like a snippet into their honesty, even if it's a derivative oh, wow. of their honesty. Well, then, so I do, I always, I always say you'd need a cover letter and keeping in mind that it's more so of a template because I also believe in customizing things depending on the company, the job. So you have like the bones, but sometimes you need to tweak some things. Um, So we, um, and, and I've never had a person that came to me with a cover letter already. 
So I typically do those from scratch. Um, but I audit everything that they have, and then we revamp everything, turn it into CRA specific, you know, resume, cover letter, LinkedIn profile. And I do everything from like the banner. We make sure they have professional profile photos. We go through like everything, their headline, their about section, like we go through everything. Um, and then I have a specific job search strategy or plan. I call it the CRA job attraction framework like that, that we go through to help them not only just because, you know, applying to jobs is like the slow, inefficient way. But once you really learn how to brand and market yourself, then you the jobs start coming to you. I haven't had to apply to a job since that in the very beginning, 20, 2013. I well, yeah, because you're a badass and you've been a senior CRA, but <laughs> what? what about somebody brand new? Like, but no, this was literally 2013 was when I, what was that? That was when I was a CTA. Mm -hmm. I haven't had to apply to any job since then because of brand and marketing and selling myself. Um, so I really, I'm really big on BMS and learning how to do that. Um, I even have mock interviews set up. So I, I've collaborated with some CRA recruiters. So they'll conduct mock interviews. We record them. They give us an assessment and evaluation report. We review that. We review the recordings, go through literally clip by clip on why this was a great answer or how this could have been a better answer or why this was an awful answer. Don't say that again. So we work through all of those kicks. A lot of people have interview anxiety. We work through that. Sometimes people <laughs> need a lot more help than just practice. So I have a protocol for the people that need to, step, you know, go to that next level of anxiety or fear. Um, but we work through all of that, even to the what point. You do, like mindfulness, like um, mindfulness or like because anxiety is like a real thing. I was actually talking to my CRC yesterday about this. Yeah, we I have all of that. So we work through all of that, um, even to the point of negotiating the offer, because a lot of wow. people, especially women, don't ask for what they want. That's like the biggest I find. Like and when I go back and I'm saying, well, Chris did you brought ask? this up. Chris brought this up on my podcast. My business partner last week, we did a podcast and he, he was like, I'm going to bring something up. And I know 70% of your audience is female. I was like, whoa, whoa, Chris, I might have to edit this. Chris." <laughs> but he said something. You just said what you said. He said, the reason women in any industry don't make as much as men primary reason there's a lot but primary primary they don't ask they're not as aggressive as men to ask for what they want i need to meet chris i'm in 100 percent agreement i say that all, <laughs> i say that all the time that's the biggest problem because i always say well did you ask no i didn't ask i didn't know i could ask that what do you mean you didn't know you could ask you can ask it's just a question nobody's gonna bite you because you asked a question the worst <laughs> thing that they can say is no so yeah. that's the biggest issue. And a lot of that goes back to confidence and mindset work. So that's my focus. And can you ask too much though? Like you can, there's still a, a limit. Like don't go in, you have no value to add. And you're like, well, I want to make 250, 250. No, but what, not that extreme, but what about like, if you're asking every month, you know, let's say this month, oh, they said yeah, no, that, next month they said no. There, but there's also there's always a strategy, a plan, a way to do things that even though you might be asking every month, the person on the other end may not realize that you're asking every month just because of the approach that you're taking. So that's another thing too, um, is that there has to be some type of finesse, I would say, mm. when it comes to asking, if you're asking at that frequency. But if you're yeah. you've been somewhere for five years, you've never been promoted, then it's time to like get frank and candid. Like, it, yeah. <laughs> sure. When am I gonna get promoted to this? It's this art. position or it's this? Art. It, right. It's science and art because I've had, I probably I was thinking about this the last month actually. I, as a, I owned a bunch of sites, small sites, never like too big. The one I'm building now is probably gonna be the biggest one. I've had like 30 employees I've directly managed, hired, managed, nurtured. A lot of them are doctors now. A lot of them are site owners now, CRA, a lot of them CRAs. And there was like 
a handful, probably 10%, maybe a little less, that would ask too often. Like I would say, no, I we can't afford it. But if like I can start doing like some kind of um, incentives for more animizations, and then that they would be cool for like three months. Then they'd ask again, and it's like, look, one of the disadvantages of a small business is like I can't just compete with Ikevia. You know, if you want more money, like at that level, you got to go with them. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, so there is like too much. But you're right, 90% don't ask enough. They don't. And then even to your point, for me, it's not always about the dollar amounts because you have to, that's why also I'm big on creating career plans. I create career development plans for my people too, because you have to look at big picture and long-term goals. And it doesn't always make sense to go just to get like that higher pay because that doesn't always equal promotion either. So you have to look at your long-term goals and say, well, is this in line with the big picture and long-term goals or am I being nearsighted and just thinking about right now? Yeah, your course is definitely needed in this space. Um, yeah, because like that that's something that, like even in our academy, we try to keep it affordable so we have like, Ashley Margo, we'll probably have you as guest lecturer now that I know you, but we have people like Ashley Margo that could do some things for them, like that's included, but in order to keep it like affordable compared to like the big ones, we can't do what you're it's doing. It's only so much you can do, right? Yeah, because yours yeah. is like three months, right? I saw something like three months on there. Or... Well, six months. I switched six it over. Months. to. Mm -hmm, I switched it over to six months because most of my clients were re-signing for another three months and people were doing mm. at least at least two or three rounds so i was like well i i might as well just switch it to six months since you know you should doing... consider well you don't have to do it just lifetime like have another tier for lifetime oh that's a good idea too yeah yeah it's good for you and them because most yeah. people won't do it for a lifetime everyone's going to retire at some point yeah of but... course um, they know what that means. It's basically unlimited access to. Which I've been working on behind the scenes. So right now I'm just only doing the one-on-one -on -one private coaching, but mm -hmm. I've been working on doing group coaching mm -hmm. so that it can be my, I I was actually thinking about making that one lifetime. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. But I've been working like behind that. the scenes to, to develop that out. So yeah, that's a good idea. That's good. I'm so glad I got the interview. So everybody, you can follow Jasmine. Um, I'm going to have her LinkedIn profile underneath or in the show notes. If you're listening, go connect with her. Um, she's an amazing person to get to know. I'm going to go live with her soon and we'll have a bunch of collabs. I can already tell <laughs> Jasmine. So yeah. We'll do a bunch of stuff, and uh, it'll be interesting to follow your career um, as we both get older in this industry. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's definitely been a pleasure. Thank you. Everybody go connect. Um, like, subscribe, comment, share, and you'll see more of Jasmine. Take care.